Welcome to Arts in the City. I'm Tony Gaida at the Music Inn in Greenwich Village. If you can name a musical instrument from anywhere in the world, they probably have it here. The Grammys are back in New York after 15 years, so on this program we celebrate New York's music scene. One good thing about music, Bob Marley said, is when it hits you, you feel no pain. Music hit Justin Lawrence so very early. Carol Ann Riddell has his story. When I generally play something that I really love, I say that I feel very passionate. I generally don't care about my surroundings. I generally like to focus on the music and my emotions just come out expressively. Justin Lorenzo is serious about the trombone. Now a senior at James Madison High School in Brooklyn, he first discovered the instrument at just eight years old through an after-school program. I initially started on the trumpet, but um, I was, being at a young age, I was more intrigued by the slide, so I made the switch. The Harmony program brings intensive instrumental music training to children in underserved communities across New York City. That means six to 10 hours a week of lessons and playing in ensembles. Justin was part of its first inaugural year. Ann Fitzgibbon is Harmony's founder and executive director. The reason the Harmony program is so intensive is that if kids are practicing the skills they need to become good musicians, they are also practicing the skills that will serve them in so many other capacities. Justin was impressive from the start. He was always serious and um, always very musical. And I remember his father coming up to me after one of their first recitals and asking me what else Justin can do because at home he's already looking up on YouTube videos of trombone players. I guess it was sort of the roots of where I, came, I am now. I guess that it generally drove me into a direction where I'm actually starting to create my own path now in my life. Justin continued to develop his craft by going to middle and high schools with strong performing arts programs. Harmony added some other amazing opportunities. I've been able to play with the Canadian Brass. I've been able to play with Wynton Marcellus. Um, and I just recently came back from a trip in Los Angeles with a whole bunch of students across the country. If you want to be successful in music, you'd have to put in the work. I mean, it does pay off, but I generally say that many, many hours have to be put in rigorously. So tell me what many, many hours means. Well, I'd say you probably would have to practice about three to five hours. Many a day? A day, yeah. Wow. On top of all your schoolwork and yeah. everything else that comes with being 17. Yeah. On top of that, Justin plays in his own band, Yesterday's Swing. He's also the first trombonist in the James Madison High School Jazz Band. Since I've been teaching, I've Justin's one of the most talented trombone players I've seen come through the Madison program, definitely. Now, Justin is focused on his future, applying to top music conservatory programs for college. His goal in 10 years, playing for the New York Philharmonic. I think that it is a difficult path, but over the years that I've put in from now, I don't think that I will be able to stop that passion that I have, and I will be able to drive forward. As Justin has grown, so has the Harmony program. It's celebrating its 10th anniversary and offers the power of music to 300 children in 15 sites across the city. Justin would have had no idea how musical he is if we had not put an instrument in his hands. So it really is just about opening the doors for so many children. I'd say that if I wasn't introduced to Harmony, then I actually have no idea what I would be doing. But I feel that music does uplift children and from a young age it does bring them a sort of a satisfaction. I say it definitely is a, a catalyst to a successful person. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Arts in the City. If you'd like to learn anything about popular music over the past 50 years, you could read tons of books, 
Or like Ari Goldberg, you could talk to Dennis Elsis. It's Dennis Elsis at Member Supported 90.7. We're WFUV and WFUV.org with the music of Bruce Springsteen. For over 45 years, Dennis Elsis has been spinning records and interviewing rock royalty in New York, becoming a fixture in NYC rock himself along the way. Today he's still at it, as we visit him where he DJs at New York City's last great progressive rock radio station, 90.7 WFUV. My responsibility and my pleasure at WFUV is to make sure that I know about the new artists that we're playing. Because at this radio station, we play a mix. We like to say music discovery starts here. So the music discovery is not just for the listener, it's also for the men and women playing the music. I loved rock and roll and I love the radio and the two together. You know, I am one of those people that grew up listening to the AM radio, listening to all those disc jockeys at the time. I didn't know it at the time, but they were helping me to form a style. And that style has served him well. Dennis first carved a name for himself as the evening DJ and music director at New York's leading rock station from the 70s through the 90s, WNEW. In that capacity, he conducted one of the most famous interviews in rock history when John Lennon decided to pop in and ended up staying for two hours. Surprise, surprise, it's <laughs> Dr. Winston O'Boogie at your service. <laughs> I am Dennis's surprise, actually. And he didn't come out of a cake or anything like that. John Lennon is with us. The Lennon interview is, is classic because, you know, in 1964, I'm a kid watching them on the Ed Sullivan Show. In 1974, I'm welcoming him to the studios of WNEWFM to literally introduce a brand new album and he puts me completely at ease. And once I realize that he's comfortable, I can talk to him not only about the new album, he's there to promote Walls and Bridges, but I can indulge myself and my audience in all these great Beatles stories. And there's some great Beatles stories told for the first time on that afternoon in that interview. Over his career, Dennis has interviewed stars from Grammy winners to songwriter Hall of Famers, the likes of Elton John, Greg Allman, Darlene Love, Patti Smith, Paul Simon, the list goes on. And as musical styles changed, Elsa's has been there to share it. I'm pretty sure I was the first person to play the Ramones and Blondie in New York because I was the radio station's music director. I was in love with the music, I was in love with the radio, and once the British invasion happened and once I was starting to get involved with college radio, there was no turning back. I have been lucky enough to live through all of that music, to see it all go through certain changes. Nowadays, along with his WFUV duties, Dennis can be heard nationally on Sirius XM's classic vinyl channel and on the Beatles channel hosting the Fab Forum call-in show. And he also presents his own multimedia stage show around the tri-state area, showcasing decades of his archived stories and interviews. It's called Rock and Roll Never Forgets. So it's an evening of storytelling and visuals and audio and it all comes together. Let's talk about my afternoon with John Lennon. Let's talk about my evening with Jerry Garcia. Let's go backstage with Pete Townsend and so all these things come alive. And as I do new ones, like talking to a Graham Nash a few years ago, we can add things and, and put new things into the show. You know, the music that you love the most is probably the music that you grew up listening to. So it's probably your early teen years through your early 20s. Those are markers for you. You're always gonna carry that stuff around. Those songs are always gonna have a special relevance whenever and however you hear them. But if your ears are open, if your mind is open, then you can appreciate new sounds and new music as it comes along. It's the Beatles on 90.7 WFUV. It's Dennis Elsis. Let's meet up again tomorrow afternoon right here and right now with some more rock and roll. From the broadcast booth on the air and on your radio, I'm Ari Goldberg for Arts in the City. Was New York? New York is James Brown performing over 200 times at the Apollo. New York is Leonard Cohen writing Chelsea Hotel at the Chelsea Hotel. It's Tito's Timbales echoing all over Spanish Harlem. The city teems with musicians whose stage is the street or the subway or a park. Buskers. Ever wonder who they are? Here's your chance to meet three of them. A busker is someone who performs uh, in public. That might be in a park, on a street corner, and often in New York and in the subway, um, and, and often accepts donations for their work.
Busking's always been around in the city, um, and there are some very early historical records that show that. There was a huge tradition with um, Italian and Eastern European immigration in the, in the 20s and 30s of like organ grinders, um, so people cranking those, those traditional organs on the street corner, people playing accordion. Busking was also both common and edgy in the 60s. Simon and Garfunkel's first album showed them playing in the subway. There was a riot of street musicians in, I believe, Washington Square Park, where they had like a, a weekly sing, and that was considered illegal at the time, and they went and they fought it and they won, and, uh, and so street performing has been legal since then. My name is Hubby Jenkins, uh, and I'm a pre-war American musician. In New York, our connection to folk music is the 50s and 60s folk scene in the West Village. And Washington Square Park was a hub for our folk music. And so when me and my crew started getting into it, we started hanging out in Washington Square Park. Um, and we'd see other people playing guitars. A lot of older people still hung out there and would have jams. Um, and we just started busking. Early on in my busking career down by Ludlow Street, I would have people call the cops on me busking over there. Um, that happened on McDougal Street, and they would say, oh, we're gonna hit you with disturbing the peace, or uh, et cetera. I just perform with my guitar and myself, and I actually have had Police officers tip me when I'm playing underground, so it's it's peaceful for for me. I know in other instances, people have had problems, but for, in my case, I was lucky. I was born in Detroit, Michigan, and I moved from there when I was five. So I spent a lot of my life in Virginia, Hampton, Virginia, and then I moved to New York when I was a teenager. No one made me move to New York. I begged my mom to move me here, so we we basically got up and we left. I knew musicians that were flourishing here, so I wanted to come to New York and follow my dreams. Coming to New York fresh out of college, I learned that performance was legal in the subway and I instantly felt drawn to that. Um, plus it was a way to, to make some money and I, I needed that at the time. I had a blast the first day and then things really deepened the second day. I was, I was arrested wrongfully for performing. I wound up in central booking for 46 hours. So that was a very um, disconcerting introduction to the world of, of subway performance. When you get arrested and, and there's this space you, you get to mentally where you think, oh, you know, I, I did something wrong, even though I had broken no laws in playing in the subway. In New York City, street performance has been legal since, I believe, the late 60s, early 70s. Subway performance was always illegal, um, though it was very much done until 1985. Um, that was the year Roger Manning, who, was a, who is a singer-songwriter, guitarist, received a summons for playing on Lexington Avenue. He contested it, and the judge actually found that it was unconstitutional to ban artistic performance in the subway since it was a public space. Busk New York really grew out of that experience I had being wrongfully arrested and the experience of a couple other people. So our mission at Busk New York is to end the phenomenon of wrongful arrest, wrongful ticketing, and, and wrongful ejection. We've facilitated over $110,000 in settlements for performers. A lot of the things I got out of busking was learning what interests people, <laughs> what doesn't interest people, and how to emote, because you have to shout over people and shout to get people's attention. There's a big difference between busking and performing, um, and definitely as I started performing on stage, I had to learn how to temper the busking attitude, but I think it helped me a lot. Carolina Chocolate Drops is a band, an all-black string band, and their mission was, you know, to be an all-black string band and to play old-time music and to talk about the black roots of American music. I met Dom Flemons. I was just like, oh snap, a black guy who plays banjo. And he's like, oh, a black guy who does whatever. And so we just connected that way. Their fiddle player quit. I got a phone call from Dom and the manager. Do you play fiddle? No, I play banjo. All right, come on, you're in. And it was the year that they won the Grammy. But because I wasn't on that record, I didn't get the Grammy. The next album we did is called Leaving Eden. We got nominated, but we didn't win. So I've got like my, my nominee medal I'd like. But my friends call me a Grammy Award losing artist. So 
I like that. <laughs> I guess you could say it, it was the subway that got me to American Idol because they found um, me underground. Being on American Idol was something I always wanted and I accomplished it. Playing underground has helped me so much because when I first started playing, I was nervous. I didn't sing the same. I didn't put the same passion. Uh, even performing wise, I didn't even connect quite the same with the audience. When I write songs, I have a pretty simple process. I pretty much just come up with the chords on my guitar. And then I don't, I don't ever have like an idea of what the song is gonna be about. I tend to just, I, I just start singing about a topic and I'm just going with that. One of my biggest influences is Ella Fitzgerald. And then I would listen to like pop indie kind of, um, that kind of style. And I think that's how it's made my style today. And I call it, well it's hard to put a label, but I say acoustic soul or pop soul, whatever you want to call it. But that's what made my sound today. How many high school friends who form a band become internationally famous? Lucky Chops is the name of one local band that did. Tina Beth Pena treats us to their brassy funk. Lucky Chops came together over a decade ago, and each member of the band finds a way to put their own spin and style to cover pop songs they find interesting. This is Walter, and he's a sousaphone. I do a lot of running, and that helps to, I guess, keep my lungs nice and strong. My name is Charles. I play the drums for Lucky Chops, and I am also the band's uh, choreographer. My trombone is my best friend. His name is Dobson. About every morning, like around 5.30, I do probably about around like a thousand lip crunches. We don't have a singer, so we have to kind of play those parts on our instruments like a singer would. So that's kind of our job is to play our instruments like a vocalist, which is really fun for us. The band's core members started as high school friends and gained sudden popularity after one of their videos went viral. We used to busk in the subway three times a week, play covers, our own songs, and one video just kind of, I guess, popped off. One thing went to the next, and then we have you know Germany calling us, hey, you like want to play over here? And they're like, yeah, sure, of course, Germany. And then like <laughs> France, Spain, and then you know, so it was it was kind of like a chain effect. And that's when they made this band their full-time job. Pretty much give my parents the shock of their life. <laughs> <laughs> Every parent wants to hear that their child is quitting their job in corporate America to join a band. A brass band. <laughs> a brass band. Yeah. A brass band at that. More like the circus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lucky Chops also creates original songs like this one called Best Things. <laughs> The band hopes to inspire young musicians to follow their passion by offering master classes in schools locally and worldwide. We're showing kids they can make bands out of, you know, if they're playing trumpet and then like they're in like fifth or sixth grade and they're thinking about quitting because they're just not really into the marching band. Maybe they think that's the only thing they can do or the only thing to look forward to. I don't think they think it's a possibility to like be a band consisting just of horns without a singer. And we're trying to make it enjoyable. I'm trying to like just spread positivity, I guess, just without talking, without singing, just having a good time. When Lucky Chops isn't inspiring students with their brassy funk or touring the world, they come back home to the Big Apple to perform. To find out when, take a look at their website for future tour dates. For Arts in the City, I'm Tina Beth Pena. 
Eight-time Grammy winner Elton John says music has healing power. You don't have to tell that to a one-time music prodigy who's finally performing again after a long, difficult absence. I'm bound for the island, the tide is with me. I think I can make it by dawn. It's night on the ocean, I'm going home. And it feels like I've never... The song has never been gone. The singer is Rini Katz. Her cabaret show is built on the same message implicit in Carly Simon's song, Tenacity. It's about embracing rather than suppressing um, things in your life that happen to you. And th therefore, you can move on and you can be open to compassion and love. What happened to Rini Katz was an urban nightmare shoved off a subway platform in front of an oncoming train. 1979, Rini was just shy of 18, an accomplished pianist and flutist with dreams of a career in music. Instead, she became famous for surviving. They pushed that girl in front of the train, took her to the doctor, sold her arm on the game. What you just heard was a segment of what Rolling Stone called the greatest hip-hop song of all time, performed by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. They pushed that girl in front of the train, took her to the doctor, and sewed her arm on again. Well, that girl was me. 16 hours of microsurgery saved her right hand, but there would be no career playing piano or the flute. My grieving was delayed because... Delayed in how? Yeah, delayed how? And it took me a while to figure this out. Two years of intensive rehabilitation, many more surgeries, and through it all, the headlines, the letters of support, the public appearances. Rini Katz was national news. Everyone was telling her story but her. Rini Katz's story, marriage, a son, Divorce, remarriage, a second career as an occupational therapist helping those whose lives were shattered like hers, and fierce determination to play piano again, even with compromised ability. I tried to concentrate not on what I lost, but I, what, what I was lucky enough to keep, and the fact that I could sing and um, had sung even through high school was my salvation. It was also the gift that allowed her, all these years on, to mount a tiny stage in Midtown and finally to tell, to sing her own story. Rini is back on stage with a new show at Don't Tell Mama, Friday, February 2nd. With the Grammys back in town later this month, it's the perfect time to experience all facets of music history and to have a blast doing it at the playfully interactive Grammy Museum in Newark. Andrew Falzone takes you there. In all of music, there is no brand more internationally recognizable than the Grammy. The small gold-plated statuettes have been shaped like gramophones since their creation to celebrate one of music's earliest recording technologies. And now local music lovers can celebrate the Grammy and all it stands for at a new museum located at the Prudential Center in Newark. It's called the Grammy Museum Experience. Newark has a great history in music, um, particularly in jazz, uh, more recently in hip hop. It'd be nice to um, shed some light on the city and its role in American music. Bob Santelli is no stranger to the world of music. He's the founding executive director of the Grammy Museum, and before that was a co-founder of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He's also a Jersey guy, having started his music journalism career at the Asbury Park Press and has contributed to Rolling Stone and the New York Times, in addition to writing more than a dozen books on American music 
music, Santelli is perhaps best known for Greetings from E Street, the biography of Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. Prudential Center, um, which is where we're located, is a great venue for concerts and it's gaining a um, more positive reputation as the years go by. More and more artists want to play there. It's got a great sound. And the museum stays open after the concerts and hockey games it hosts. The ticket prices between $7 and $10 keep the museum family friendly as the museum tries to bridge many of the gaps in music education. When you get a kid um, from East LA or you get a kid from Newark and th they sit down for the first time and put a pair of headphones on and they have a DJ board there, it's a pretty cool experience to see these kids, their faces light up and they're actually creating music. So perhaps the best part of the experience is that it's entirely interactive, whether you want to learn how to play a guitar, sit behind a piano, or even get a drum lesson with Max Weinberg, anything is possible. You can pull up a seat and soak it all in as the E Street drummer will show you some of his fanciest moves. While Newark native Wyclef Jean will coach you through the lyrics of his 90s classic, Gone Till November. Said I'll be gone till November, I'll be gone till November, yeah. Tell my girl I'll be gone till November. So that whether you're 8 years old or 80, the idea is using technology to get inside the music or underneath it so you understand how music is made. Also on display, of course, are actual Grammy Awards showing the evolution of the trophy throughout the decades. The museum also has a room that will feature rotating exhibits. Right now it shows off a collection of wardrobe memorabilia that was used in great Grammy performances like Pavarotti's 1999 performance of Nessum Dorma and Kanye's 2006 marching band performance of Gold Digger. Long after the Grammy Awards pack up from Madison Square Garden and head home back west where it's a heck of a lot warmer, the Grammy Museum experience will remain at the Prudential Center in Newark for generations to come. I'm Andrew Falzone for Arts in the City. From popular music to the Royal Scepter, Queen Victoria is back in the second season of that wildly popular PBS series. We sat down with Daisy Goodwin, producer and writer of Victoria. She has a new book out, Victoria and Albert, A Royal Love Affair. Goodwin gave us a preview of season two. I have come to ask your advice. I'm no longer in politics, ma'am. It would be wrong for me to advise you. It's not the kind of advice I need. I want to talk to you about marriage. I think anybody who's negotiated marriage and motherhood will enjoy the new series to see how Victoria does that. And I think, I hope you'll enjoy, you know, the real deepening of the relationship between Victoria and Albert. And they both have some really serious challenges to face in this series. And, you know, the way that they negotiate them is, I, I hope, really engaging. There are some tears, I warn you. Um, keep your Kleenex handy. Season two of Victoria premieres January 14th at 9 on Masterpiece on PBS. You can see the full interview with Daisy Goodwin next month on Arts in the City. That's our program for today, and for more information on our stories, go to cuny.tv. I'm Tony Guida. Thanks for joining us. See you next time on Arts in the City.